All right, we will get started. Hello and welcome everyone to the Immune Deficiency Foundation Skin Compass Lunch and Learn. Today's webinar will explore monoclonal antibody instead of chemotherapy prior to HSCT with Dr. Christopher Dvorak from the University of California, San Francisco. My name is Alyssa Kramer and I'm the Director of Specialized Projects at the Immune Deficiency Foundation. And on behalf of all of us at IDF, I'd like to thank you for joining us this afternoon for this Lunch and Learn. We are excited to host this webinar for our IDF and SCID communities. IDF is dedicated to fostering a community empowered by education. We want you to remember that IDF is committed to our community, serving you as a trusted resource through the use of technology and innovation. We are here to give you the tools and information to become empowered and offer you our compassion, understanding, and support to emphasize that you are not alone on your journey with PI. Today's Lunch and Learn is part of IDF's regular series of bite-sized programming that provides diagnosis-specific information and support to our community, wherever they may be. A brief disclaimer, so please remember that the information presented during this forum is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. We are here today as a trusted source and friend to provide you with information. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with questions concerning a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking it based on information presented during an educational forum or event. Many of you tuning in today are doing so because you are an individual, parent, caregiver, or friend to someone with severe combined immunodeficiency or SCID. SCID Compass, an educational program of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, is designed to guide parents of infants diagnosed with SCID, people living with SCID, and the medical community through the journey of learning about this rare and life-threatening medical disorder and finding support to navigate the health challenges along the way. Skid Compass is supported by a grant through the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, which is an agency of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Skid Compass was developed through a partnership between the Immune Deficiency Foundation, RTI International, and the Association of Public Health Laboratories, with support from Expecting Health and the Skid Angels for Life Foundation. To learn more about SCID and SCID Compass, please explore our website at www.skidcompass.org. The website is also available in Spanish and French, and you can access those by toggling between languages in the upper navigation panel of the website. I would now like to welcome our presenter for today, Dr. Christopher Dvorak from UCSF. Welcome, Dr. Dvorak, and I will start stop sharing my screen, and you should be able to pick up um, with your own slides. Great, thank you so much, Alyssa, and thank you uh, to the IDF for having me today. Um, so I am Chris Dvorak. I am Chief of Pediatric Allergy Immunology Bone Marrow Transplant at UCSF, and I have the honor of being a co-primary investigator for the uh, National uh, Primary Immune Deficiency Treatment Consortium in conjunction with Jennifer Puck at UCSF and Ellie Haddad from Montreal. I also lead the prospective uh, SCID natural history study in the PIDTC. So I do think I, I know a lot about SCID and hopefully I can help um, over the next uh, 45 minutes or so tell you about some of the fun things that we're doing to try to make uh, SCID transplants safer and more effective for future patients. I do have some disclosures, which are that I get grant research support from Jasper Therapeutics uh, and one of their products I will be talking about today. I'm a consultant for some companies that I won't be talking about today. And virtually every medication I use today is either off-label or experimental, since there are no agents that are approved uh, for conditioning infants with SCID. If you're on this call, hopefully you already know a little bit about SCID, but uh, to remind people, uh, SCID is not one disease. It's actually a, um, quite a few different uh, genetic diseases that all have in common a profound disturbance in the function, in the, both the development uh, and uh, function of T and B cells. And really the, the hallmark, of course, is absence of T cells, though in leaky forms, uh, there can be T cells present that don't work uh, well. And some forms of SCID uh, have uh, B cells present that uh, don't function, whereas other forms of SCID tend to have uh, minimal to no B cells uh, at all. 
And these types of skid are inherited in different uh, patterns with, of course, the classic uh, common gamma chain form of skid uh, inherited in an X-linked form and most others in an autosomal recessive uh, manner. So why do you need conditioning or preparation prior to, to any transplant for any disease? Uh, well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that uh, we give myeloablation to uh, kill the hematopoietic stem cells and make space for donor stem cells to attach into the niches in the bone marrow. And we're going to spend the bulk of today's talk uh, focused on myeloablation. Some diseases that have uh, in patients with intact immune systems or partially intact immune systems um, also require immunosuppression to eliminate T cells or NK cells that could mediate rejection of donor cells. Um, but you know, depending on the disease you're transplanting, not, uh, both of these are not absolutely needed. And as you may know, uh, some patients with SCID uh, are, or have classically been transplanted with no conditioning whatsoever. Um, myeloblation is, is our big thing that we're focused on today because, of course, all currently myelo, available myeloblation agents belong to a class of chemotherapy known as alkylators, and alkylators are what we consider to be uh, the highest risk for causing long-term side effects in our patients. So SCID is a, a really special case. This is a paper uh, that I published in conjunction with friends across the world um, several years ago now, looking at unconditioned transplant, not only in matched sibling donors, where um, patient, a, a wide variety of patients um, were alive and well without any forms of conditioning um, with a matched sibling donor, we also showed that unrelated donors uh, could uh, be put into patients with SCID without any conditioning whatsoever, uh, especially um, when some, a little bit of serotherapy, so a non-chemotherapy-based um, antibody approach uh, was used. We got survival rates similar to what was seen um, with matched sibling donor transplants. I do need to spend a little bit of time talking about chimerism because this is a very important concept uh, when understanding you know, what's going on in skid transplants and with uh, myeloablation. So chimerism is, is basically just the measurement of the percentage of donor cells. Many centers use just a whole blood chimerism. They just look at every cell in the blood and what percentage of those are from the donor. I personally don't find this to be a very useful test because it doesn't really get into the details of what's going on at a cellular level. Um, and so we like to focus on uh, lineage specific chimerism and especially myeloid chimerism, which uh, is classically measured um, by CD1415 or CD33 at some centers. And the reason why this is so useful is because myeloid cells have a very short lifespan in the blood, usually about a week or so. And so this is a really good surrogate marker for what's going on in the bone marrow, uh, because what's coming out um, and into the blood, it has to be produced uh, from uh, stem cells engrafted in the marrow. And this is in con contrast to something like T cells or B cells, which can live for years and years and years and don't reflect what's actively going on in the uh, bone marrow uh, compartment. And this, this way we can avoid having to actually, you know, go into a patient's hips and do a bone marrow aspirate to, to see what kind of engraftment we have in the bone marrow. So these are some slides uh, that I stole from my good friend Sung Young Pai now at uh, the NIH about what's going on in skid transplants. So after an unconditioned transplant in skid, we have what's called split chimerism. So in the bone marrow, um, minimal to no uh, donor HSCs will attach. And most of the cells will be these uh, blue cells that are from the host. And so the red cells will be from the host, uh, the neutrophils will be from the host, the platelets will be from the host, B cells will be from the host because B cells are made in the bone marrow, hence their name. T cells, of course, are, are originally, the precursors are generated in the bone marrow, but then the uh, daughter cells go through the thymus to be matured, and that, that's why the, they're called T cells. Um, but what we'll see here in a patient with SCID who can't make their own T cells is that all the T cells will come from the donor. So there'll be a classic split chimeric you know, 95 to 100% donor in T cells and everything else will be zero to 1% classically donor. 
And then after a conditioned transplant, uh, you tend to get full or high uh, mixed donor chimerism, where most of the cells in the bone marrow are now from the donor because you've made space for them to attach. And so there may be a little bit of residual host uh, stem cells, uh, but now most of the cells in every compartment will, um, will be from the donor. So when we're trying to do a transplant for a patient with skid, chimerism is not a goal per se, it's really a surrogate. Uh, the goals are, of course, to, number one, and the most important is to get T-cell immunity. And ideally, we get T-cell immunity with high levels of naive T-cells, which we measure by looking at um, a marker called CD45RA, because those are the cells that a patient needs to be ready to respond to new challenges through the rest of their life. Um, B-cell immunity is a nice goal to also get. Uh, it's not quite as essential as T-cell immunity. Um, but without B cell immunity, you can't discontinue gamma globulin, you can't make specific antibody uh, responses to vaccines and other real life challenges. So there's many patients out there who have um, T cell immunity with, with incomplete B cell immunity and continue to be on gamma globulin replacement. Um, we'd like to, of course, accomplish both. And, and importantly, we'd like to accomplish these with minimal side effects, both short term and long term. So conditioning is definitely good for in many cases, though it, it also potentially has some downsides. So Sung Young Pai published a paper uh, quite a few years ago now showing that patients that got uh, what we call re uh, reduced intensity conditioning or fully myeloblative conditioning had much more reliable uh, long-term production of uh, naive T cells. You could see there were some patients that, that uh, despite conditioning didn't get uh, good naive T cells, but you can see in the group that did not get conditioning, many patients had uh, very poor uh, naive T cell production long-term. Though interestingly, there was a group that, um, that actually did quite well and teasing out why some people uh, do uh, well despite lack of conditioning is, is an active area of investigation. And Eli Haddad published a follow-up uh, paper um, extending the observations of this paper in 2018 and showed that patients were 10 times more likely to recover T cells if they got conditioning, five times more likely to recover B cells, have uh, less than half the, the uh, or about half the, the need for a second transplant if they got conditioning the first time around. But importantly, conditioning to induces tissue injury and tissue injury um, increases the risk of graft versus host disease. So there was about a 50% uh, higher likelihood of getting graft versus host disease in patients that uh, were conditioned with classic chemotherapy. And then long-term, we're of course very worried about um, you know, what these conditioning agents do to our, these very, very young infants. And the data for this is not great at the moment. Um, Jen Heimel and others uh, put together a very nice um, consensus statement a few years ago, uh, looking at what the current knowledge was um, about late effects after transplant for skid and, and trying to highlight priorities for future research. And Jen is, is actively involved in our newest uh, PIDTC trial, trying to, to really uh, do a much better job of analyzing this in the future. Um, but you can see that, um, you know, in patients that, uh, that receive conditioning, um, some of which are um, listed here, though uh, some patients don't get conditioning, uh, that there's, there are some concerns that these patients may have neurologic dysfunction. Uh, similarly, we worry about um, you know, risks of growth failure, dental issues, uh, going through puberty normally, uh, fertility, um, so these are, are important, important questions. And I think especially important because considering how young these patients are when we administer these agents to them. Uh, and then of course, there's a special form of SCID that we call Artemis deficiency, pretty rare in most uh, patient populations, but uh, these patients have a, a very profound um, sensitivity to alkylating agents. Uh, much more so than, than RAG patients that otherwise look um, pretty similar from an immunologic perspective. And you can see that uh, RAG patients who um, get alkylating chemotherapy, their height is pretty similar to the patients um, that don't get alkylating chemotherapy. Uh, but ARDS patients uh, that get 
uh, alkylating chemotherapy are very, very, very short uh, compared to Artemis patients that uh, don't get alkylating chemotherapy. And it also extended to a wide variety of other problems, dental abnormalities, endocrinologic deficiencies, kidney problems, pancreas problems. Um, this is, this is a big problem for these patients and a, and a huge area uh, of interest that we want to try to do better for, for these patients. And you know, what this has led to is this very sort of confusing menu that we use at many centers of genotype specific approaches to conditioning um, because different genotypes have um, sort of different outcomes and functionality of their B cells, uh, et cetera. And so Bobby Gaspar, uh, formerly of uh, Great Ormond Street, uh, shared this with me many years ago. I've, I've modified it over the years. But basically, you sort of look at what the specific genotype is and what donor type you have, and you sort of uh, pick from that and decide what to do for a particular patient uh, sitting in front of you. Um, but you can see it's pretty complex and it leads to uh, um, problems because we tend to, to put all the skin patients together for our papers um, be because they're so rare. But in reality, um, each genotype probably behaves a little bit differently and needs to be teased apart. And it's another thing that the PIDTC plans to be doing over the next couple of years is put out a series of genotype specific papers to really get at what the best approach is for each uh, particular subtype of skid. There is no doubt that over the years, there's been an increasing use of conditioning regimens. Uh, Monica Thakar uh, at Seattle published uh, an abstract, is working on the paper right now, showing that over time, um, myeloablative conditioning is increasing in use and uh, reduced intensity conditioning is really increased in use, such that um, in the old days, uh, most patients got no conditioning, and now it's only about a quarter of patients who uh, get that approach. And um, the overall survival for, for SCID is, is, of course, uh, really good, um, just regardless of what uh, donor you're using, uh, especially for matched siblings um, and uh, other related donors, mismatch related, all are doing very, very well in the most uh, recent decade, uh, sort of independent of conditioning. So several years ago, you know, we at UCSF tried to bridge the divide between um, you know, no conditioning whatsoever and full conditioning with high exposure busulfan. And we published this paper um, using what we call low exposure busulfan. So we targeted busulfan uh, to about 30. Um, this is about a third of the uh, amount of busulfan that you give a patient with leukemia, for example. And what we found was quite interesting, which is that patients started with very high level uh, chimerism in all cell lines, but then that CD14, that myeloid chimerism fell pretty dramatically over the first year and it, and it stabilized out somewhere in the five to 10% range. So what we realized is that busulfan is pretty good at clearing committed myeloid progenitors, but it's not actually that good at eradicating uh, hematopoietic stem cells, especially when, when you're not using very high doses. Um, and although the, this was the median in that five to 10% range, the, the, the final myeloid chimerism was actually all over the place. There were some patients as low as two or 3%, other patients that were 70%. Um, and, uh, and, and this is despite the fact that they all got a very, very tight range of this. And I think what's going on is that there's a uh, very difficult to measure contribution of, a, of what we call the graft versus marrow effect that I'll talk about in a minute. But the, the important thing that we learned in this paper is that despite uh, these patients ending up with very low donor myeloid chimerism, just in the, the three to 5% range for some of those patients, they all developed B cells uh, and, and were vaccinated and came off IVIG. And so we were uh, pretty excited about that because it suggested that we don't need to give uh, the really high doses of busulfan that you give a leukemia patient. So this led to uh, the development of a joint trial uh, between the PIDTC um, and the Pediatric Blood and Marrow Transplant Consortium, chaired by Sung Young Pai uh, and Mike Pulsifer at CHLA. And the central question is, um, you know, can we replicate that UCSF experience at uh, a larger number of centers and sort of definitively prove 
to uh, the worldwide community that you don't need higher doses of busulfan. So it's randomizing patients without a matched sibling donor and without an active infection who have one of these uh, four genotypes, um, either X-linked, JAK3, RAG1 or RAG2, to getting either uh, the low exposure busulfan or kind of a, a moderate exposure busulfan, still lower than you'd give a leukemia patient, which is about 90. Um, uh, and then because RAG is a little different uh, than IL-2-RG or JAK3, they get some additional um, uh, chemotherapy agents. And then they all get a very similar approach to transplant um, without immunosuppression and ex vivo T cell depletion and are followed to see um, not only how they're doing in general, but very specifically, are they developing specific antibody responses um, after transplant and therefore really definitively uh, IVIG free. Um, but we think we can potentially do even cooler than that. Uh, and that's the point of this talk is to, uh, to get into details of monoclonal antibodies. Um, Busulfan's a very useful agent that we've been using for a long time, but um, it's still not the, our ultimate end game. Our end game is to, to get away from alkylating chemotherapy completely. So the first group to, to do something in this uh, space was the Great Ormond Street uh, group in London, who published this paper over a decade ago using a monoclonal antibody against a protein called CD45. And CD45 is selectively expressed not only on, on white blood cells, and, uh, and, and, but it's also on hematopoietic progenitors. And importantly, it's absent on virtually all non-hematopoietic tissues. So it's very, very targeted to what we wanna get at, and it doesn't have off-target effects like busulfan does to the skin, hair, uh, mouth, gut, um, liver, et cetera, lungs. Um, so Great Ormond Street enrolled 16 patients. And you know, because skid is rare, it's a sort of a mixture of typical skids and a bunch of leaky uh, forms of skid, as well as some other immunodeficiencies that are not really skid. Um, and it, so it, it, the data became a little tough to analyze because, um, because of the mixture of patients. And they were sort of afraid to do it by itself, um, just give the antibody alone because most of these patients had at least some immune system, the, the typical skids didn't. Uh, so they combined it with some classic uh, non um, myeloablating chemotherapy, fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, as well as another monoclonal antibody, uh, alentuzumab, to prevent graft versus host disease. Um, so it's not a perfect example of, um, of antibody only conditioning, but it was the first step in this direction. And they, there were some patients that weren't really available for graftment, uh, and the results were sort of all over the place. Um, the, one of the ex-skid patients had really no response, no donor myeloid chimerism. The other one did have uh, variable um, amounts of myeloid chimerism, uh, along with some of the other uh, leaky skids. And then it, some patients actually did shockingly well, were 100% donor with, again, again, with no other myeloablation added. So I thought these results were quite interesting. And I was always sort of surprised that the Great Ormond Street group never really followed up with this. So I, I asked them one time at a meeting why they weren't doing more with this uh, drug. And it, there was a couple um, explanations, one of which is that the, the, they stopped producing uh, the agent. Um, but importantly, they really felt like the reason why some patients did better is that those were patients that developed graft versus host disease. And they had this graft versus marrow effect uh, that kicked in uh, to um, eliminate some of the host stem cells. And they, they felt like it just wasn't, that was not a, a, a reliable and efficient way to uh, do things. And that, that this was, was something that, that they didn't want to pursue further. So here's an example of the graft versus marrow effect that I've talked about a few times. So this is a, a girl with skid transplanted many years ago now at UCSF um, who came in, was very, very sick. This was actually the pre-newborn skiing era. Uh, so probably 2008, 2009. And um, she had all kinds of different infections going on, uh, had no matched sibling. And, uh, but she did have uh, quite a few uh, very well-matched unrelated donors. So we got her one quite quickly. 
Uh, but we're afraid to condition her because of all her active infections. So we just dumped the unrelated donor cells into her. And you can see that 13 days post-transplant, um, most of the cells were still host, other than a small number of, of T cells now developing. But then a couple of days later, she developed pretty bad graft-versus-host disease. Uh, so you can get GVH even without conditioning um, uh, because you, you, when you're infected, you're also very inflamed and that can lead to development of GVH. Um, she eventually, we got her through this with steroids and some other agents and, and she recovered completely from that without any chronic GVH. Uh, so that's good. Um, but uh, what we what happened afterwards really shocked us. Uh, so we, she started to see that that everything started coming up, and importantly, um, be somewhere between the one month and two months post transplant, her stem cells, so the, as measured by that surrogate marker CD fourteen fifteen, went from very very low up to nearly one hundred percent. And we keep, kept watching her and she's again, she's over 10 years out now. And, and uh, I didn't put the whole graph in here, but she stayed hundred percent donor in all cell lines. Uh, again, with no conditioning whatsoever. So the only thing that, that made space in her bone marrow uh, was the uh, immunologic attack uh, on the bone marrow. The problem is that grade three graft host disease is not fun for patients to go through. Um, so we don't want to rely on, on that technique. Um, and it's not reliable either in that we've had patients with bad GVH before that don't uh, get a graft versus marrow effect. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of a fascinoma that this happens, but it's not a, um, you know, a, a real good strategy for treating future patients. So we moved on to another approach um, called anti-CD117. Uh, I'll usually call it anti-C kit. And um, that was done originally in conjunction with uh, our friends at Stanford University uh, who developed this in the laboratory. And then they've sold it onto a uh, company um, and the company is called Jasper. So the, the agent's now called JSP191. So, uh, you know, the current transplant conditioning regimens kill HSCs uh, through highly toxic regimens, right? They, they damage everything in the cells, uh, sort of die. Whereas CD117 on the surface of HSCs, uh, we'll talk about how that works. It, it um, doesn't re really produce DNA damage per se, but um, it leads to cell death and an empty marrow space without uh, off target side effects. So, what a JSP191 is doing is it's an antibody that blocks uh, this, this molecule, CD117, and it just sort of sits on top of that protein. And what that protein is, um, is the receptor for a, a, um, a chemokine called stem cell factor. So this is a, um, a protein that our bodies make all the time that in that keeps stem cells alive. So stem cells are reliant upon constantly being bathed in stem cell factor uh, to stay alive. And if they, if that that constant bathing gets turned off because the receptor is blocked, the stem cells just naturally die off. Um, and so it creates depletion of the marrow in a very um, kind of targeted way. And because other cells ex express almost no CD one seventeen. Um, there's no off-target toxicities and no tissue injury. So that's, that's at least the theory. Um, and again, here, I guess here it is again, blocking CD117 so that you can't get signaling through it, um, leading to clearance in these empty niches uh, that are filled with, with stem cell factors. So when you put a donor cell in there, then they get um, bathed in uh, stem cell factor and start uh, proliferating widely. So um, this is cool, but it's also a little bit tricky because you have to wait to put the donor stem cells in until after the monoclonal antibody has been eliminated from the system. And the monoclonal antibody doesn't, doesn't kill every single donor or host cell. So there's this, this narrow window where you need to get the donor cells into these niches before the host uh, stem cells start to rebound and grow back. Um, but in theory, this is what's going on. So comparing an old conventional transplant to a new selective transplant is you're, um, you're starting here with um, HSCs and there's nothing wrong with the HSCs, but then the 
the patient has either a population of defective daughter cells or um, in this case, just absent T cells uh, in SCID. And then you come in with conditioning and you wipe out everything, right? It's not very selective or fancy. Um, whereas with an antibody, you come in and you just wipe out the, the stem cells alone. You leave everything else intact. So here um, in the chemo system, you know, there's tons of space. You dump in the donor cells and then they grow back uh, and repopulate the marrow over time. Whereas in the C-Kit approach, you dump in the donor cells and then over a very long time, they slowly will grow out and replace um, the, you know, the, the cells that are defective or missing. Uh, but this is definitely a slow process because there's more of a drive to produce things like T cells when there's, when there's complete absence of things. Um, and so this, this chemo-based approach is faster, in my opinion, uh, the, whereas the, um, the C-Kit approach, the antibody approach is definitely going to be a little slower. But slow is okay if the patient comes in healthy, uninfected, thanks to newborn screening. Um, and you know, it's definitely worth it in the long run to avoid uh, the, the effects of, of chemotherapy. So this trial has been going on for a few years now, and it's uh, recently expanded to uh, some additional sites. So it used to be that patients had to come to Northern California and get treated either at Stanford or uh, UCSF, but um, we've now expanded it uh, to sites uh, around the country, New York City, LA, uh, Minnesota, Atlanta, Cincinnati, and, um, and at the NIH. Uh, so we have a, a little more availability to this uh, without having to force patients to uh, travel. So far, we've enrolled 17 patients. Uh, first patient was, was my patient who uh, went to Stanford because they wanted to um, administer the, the first dose there. Um, and, uh, but you can see we've treated uh, the bulk of the patients at UCSF. Uh, and then um, some more recent ones uh, at Stanford and uh, Sloan Kettering. There's two groups to this trial. So group A is the patients who uh, have previously undergone a transplant and are getting a boost transplant to try to prop up sort of failing immunity and or get them some functional B cells. Uh, so, um, whereas group B are the newly diagnosed babies. Uh, so there's only been two of those so far. And because this is a brand new agent, it's never been used in uh, patients before other than some safety trials uh, done um, in healthy adult volunteers, we didn't really know what the right dose was. We had some ideas based on animal data, but animal data never really translates to people. So, um, so we started with a very, very low dose uh, that, that didn't do a whole lot, moved to an intermediate dose that was better, uh, then went to a higher dose that actually didn't work as well as the intermediate dose, and then have backed down and are sort of testing two intermediate doses of 0.3 and 0.6. And I'll show you, so, oh, and the very first patient um, was my patient here. Um, she was so famous uh, for doing this, being the first patient in the world to, to get this uh, kind of novel therapy that she got featured in a movie that came out um, sometime last year. Unfortunately, the movie budget um, for CGI was a little low, so they forgot to fill in some hair here uh, for me, uh, but it's a pretty uh, cool movie to watch if you're interested. So how is this working? Well, it's working pretty well. We still have to uh, you know, tune it up some more, but we're pretty happy with it. The, the cool thing is, unlike some monoclonal antibodies where you can have allergic reactions, we've seen essentially no infusion-related side effects. It's like giving water to patients. And there's no other apparent short or long-term side effects from the antibody. I mean, literally nothing that I can tell has happened to these patients. We did have one patient um, who had a history of autoimmune hemolytic anemia after her first transplant, who started having really fast B cell recovery, which sometimes we see autoimmune things happening when, when that occurs. And uh, she developed an autoimmune attack on her red blood cell precursors. So she did need to be treated with some immunosuppressive therapy. The process is now fully resolved. And this is something that unfortunately we see after any kind of transplant, regardless of use of conditioning or not. Um, so you know, it, I don't think that this is really truly a side effect of the, the 
transplant or the, the trial itself, but just a, a known transplant complication. And the, the first patients we kept inpatient for a few weeks because we didn't really know what was going to happen. But now we've learned that, that nothing happens to these patients. They're totally um, feeling fine. And so we now do most of this as an outpatient. They come in uh, usually for two days to get the antibody in the first couple antibody levels. Then they're sent home. Uh, and then they come back in for one night to get their stem cells a couple of weeks later, uh, but it's all done as an outpatient, which is, which is really cool. So what are the early results so far? Um, so for the retransplanted patients, we've learned that the 0.1 dose was too low, so we're not using that anymore. We've also learned that, um, that there's some genotype specific differences. So our, our X-link skids, our IL-2RG skids have not responded as well as some of the other genotypes. Um, and there, we're actively investigating why that is. We think we have some theories um, and we'll make some modifications to the protocol to, to help this work for the X-link skids. Um, but the intermediate doses do seem to induce long lasting myeloid chimerism. The company didn't want me to show that data today because uh, it's not published yet. Um, they're working to get that published, but uh, they, they would let me uh, show uh, some of the details of what's going on with these patients. So for example, here's a patient who's, um, who's a, a teenager and uh, allowed us to do a bone marrow aspirate on them uh, before the antibody was given. And you could see the, how many stem cells they had in their marrow. And then after the antibody was given, you can see not all the stem cells are gone, but they're significantly shrunk down in uh, number. And you can see the immune cell reconstitution. Uh, so this is a patient who had essentially no um, uh, B cells whatsoever uh, before transplant, reach transplant, boost transplant, and then has uh, started to develop uh, B cell recovery. Again, very slow, right? This is like a year post transplant. It's coming back, but it's but it is coming back. This patient didn't have um, a very profound. Uh, defect in their total number of CD4s, but you can also see that nothing went down, right? So unlike a, a full second transplant, we don't make the patient any worse. We don't take away their current immunity. We're just um, boosting it up over time. Um, and uh, babies uh, seem to respond especially well. So this is the, uh, the first patient uh, who's an IL-2RG skid, a newly diagnosed baby. Um, and uh, you know, not, not much happened for the first couple months, which is typical after a, a ex vivo T cell depleted transplant. But then uh, T cells, both CD8 and CD4, have come up quite nicely. Looks like they they are coming down, but you know they're coming down at a level that's still uh, fabulous, right? Over a thousand, and they're almost all naive T cells, uh, and has developed uh, proliferative responses. Uh, so this patient looks like they're going to be um, the cured, and their myeloid chimerism number wise looks very, very similar to what we get with low exposure busulfan. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. And, you know, here's uh, some data we generated and published in an ASH abstract a couple of years ago. So this is data from UCSF, five representative skid patients that had poor immunity and we brought in to do just a boost, right? We just gave more donor stem cells uh, to them. This was before the trial was open, and really not much happened to their immune system. Their naive T cells started low um, and continued to be very low for years after the boost. Uh, never got into a range that we would consider to be adequate for uh, these patients to be protected. And most of them have gone on to, to get either uh, gene therapy or participate in the trial. Um, for another boost. But after the boost with JSP191, so the, again, the only thing that's different between these patients and these patients is that before the boost, they got this monoclonal antibody. You can see not all of them responded, but some of them have responded really, really nicely um, and are making normal numbers of naive T cells. Um, and we're pretty excited about that. Uh, there also seems to uh, be some some improvement in their status with this. Uh, the first patient had chronic norovirus, which is resolved and started to gain weight, um, brought down, she hasn't come off IVIG, but has uh, reduced it. Uh, subject four, um, she had problems with chronic sinusitis, uh, was getting antibiotics all the time, that's completely resolved. 
And uh, while she's still on IVIG, that's because she's the one that developed the autoimmune um, suppression of her red cell precursors and needed a dose of rituximab. So I'm hopeful that as that wears off and her B cells are, are starting to recover, that she's going to eventually come off it. And we've had two patients who have uh, discontinued IVIG and made antibody responses to vaccines. And again, I've never seen that happen with a plain boost. So I, I'm pretty convinced that this antibody is doing something. We've got to continue to to you know, fine tune this, but I'm really, really excited about the results that we're seeing. So there are some, some potential additional optimizations we can make. So Dr. Shizuru, whose lab really led uh, this, she's an adult transplanter at Stanford. She's found that, that if you uh, give this um, antibody in conjunction with a, a drug called 5-azacitidine, which is technically a form of chemotherapy, for used for treatment of patients with myelodysplastic syndrome, but it's a nucleoside analog. So it's not an alkylator. It doesn't cause long-term side effects. Um, but if you do that, you can get much better donor myeloid chimerism. Uh, and this is in mice uh, with fully full immune systems, not skid mice. Um, but uh, we're, so we're, we're thinking that we can eventually take this beyond skid uh, into other diseases, but, or at least use it in uh, some of the more difficult forms of SCID uh, to, um, to engraft like the older patients with IL-2-RG X-linked SCID. And you know, I would be remiss to say that the Jasper antibody is the only one out there. There's some other promising ones uh, that are being explored. There is a company, a brief lived company called 47 uh, that's now been bought by Gilead that um, makes a, a separate antibody to, to CD47, uh, which is an, it was, what's we call a don't eat me signal. So if you block it, you increase the immunologic clearance of antibody coated cells. So here, what they were doing is giving two antibodies simultaneously, one against CD117, not just to block signaling, but to basically then tell neutrophils and monocytes to go in and attack any cell that's coated with um, the antibody. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a, um, an interesting approach. It looks really good in mice, um, but the company sort of abandoned uh, future clinical development, unfortunately, for the, at least for the time being. Um, another company called Magenta is basically taken the, the CD117 antibody and stuck a toxin on it. This is a, a drug called amanitin, which is derived from the death cap mushroom. And it basically delivers this toxin, again, very specifically to, to cells that only have um, CD117 on them, like the hematopoietic stem cells in the uh, marrow. So you know, these are not, haven't been used in humans yet, to my knowledge, um, but, uh, you know, do look very promising in mice. CD, I do worry CD747 uh, blockade could activate the immune system and theoretically could result in uh, autoimmunity, autoinflammation. And uh, on the other hand, CD117, although expressed in very low levels on other cells beyond HSCs, uh, it's not 100% specifically on HSCs, and it doesn't, that doesn't seem to matter when you're using a naked antibody, um, but when you deliver a toxin to those other cells, you could theoretically start to have some off-target side effects. So I am watching very carefully to see um, you know, what additional data these uh, companies, especially this one, which is, which is still actively developing this, uh, put out um, to see what, um, you know, what's happening. I, I think, you know, there's some theoretical reasons why this may be more effective than uh, the Jasper an naked antibody, but I, I do worry that it could also increase toxicity, which is always a, a trade-off that we have to deal with. And, you know, this, this is still primarily a, a very niche thing just for certain types of skid, but we envision future benefits here, right? Um, so for patients that have T cells like leaky skid or NK cells that can mediate re rejection, we're gonna have to eventually combine this with some form of immunoablation, um, which is, and some of that can be done with monoclonal antibodies as well, um, but may require some chemotherapy. 
the good news is that the majority of the short and long-term toxicity of transplant comes from the myeloablation agent. So adding a little bit of immunoablation should be not uh, too increasingly toxic. But uh, what we're really, really, really excited about uh, here at UCSF and, and elsewhere is combining this with autologous gene therapy, right? Because all of the SCID gene therapy protocols that you may have heard about um, use low exposure busulfan. But if we're getting the same kind of myeloid chimerism with a monoclonal antibody uh, that you're getting to low exposure busulfan, why would you use low exposure busulfan? And the gene therapy community has been very concerned recently because there's been some reports of leukemia in patients with sickle cell disease undergoing gene therapy, um, not uh, due to the same mechanism of the old SCID um, gene therapy leukemias. Uh, and they, they think that it's, it's probably due to the higher exposure of busulfan. Again, they're using higher exposures than we use in skid gene therapy, but I think it, it's a concern. And um, although it's not been reported yet, uh, you know, there's no reason to, to be satisfied with low exposure busulfan if we can eventually replace it uh, in conjunction with autologous gene therapy. So what I, what I dream of is this, this 100% cure, right? Uh, so in the old days, we used to have patients that came in sick with things like CMV, and we'd try to get them as healthy as we could. And then we'd have to decide, do we condition them? Do we not condition them? Chemotherapy, and you dump aloe cells in. And we, not all of them survived. And the ones that did, did not always have complete immune reconstitution, and we had risk of long-term side effects. But now with newborn screening, they come in well, we can, if we're really smart about it, we can generally keep them um, isolated and prophylaxed so that they stay uninfected. And then if they have, uh, you know, autogene therapy option, that's great, or you can do an allotransplant. But in either case, we would use these safer conditioning options tailored to the specific genotype. And so that basically, um, you know, I think SCID is going to be the first disease where we can reliably get 100% survival uh, after transplant with full immune reconstitution and no long-term side effects, what I would call morbidity-free survival. That is really our dream. Um, we're not quite there yet, but we're, we're making good progress towards it. Uh, I've not done this by myself. Uh, I want to thank, of course, all my collaborators uh, um, from, the, uh, from the PIDTC, many of whom are not listed here. Uh, Judy Suzuru and Aniska Chekowitz at Stanford were really instrumental in developing uh, the C-Kit antibody, um, now owned by Jasper Therapeutics. And of course, we get um, grant funding uh, from the NIH to support the PIDTC. So with that, I'd like to stop and, and take any questions that people may have. Great. Thank you, Dr. Dvorak. Uh, we do have quite a few questions that have come in. <clears throat> so I will just start with one of them. Um, there's a lot of great um, individuals here who represent the Wiscott Aldridge community. So they are wondering if this technology can be used um, in the future or currently for Wiscott Aldridge. Yeah, I mean, for sure. We, we want to certainly move this beyond SCID someday. I think we need to, to SCID is a nice disease to optimize it in. Um, and, and, but once we start having it working for something like a leaky skid, those patients are not that much different than, um, than a Wiscott, at least immunologically. Uh, the one question is going to be, you know, what degree of myeloid chimerism is, is required to, um, to completely correct Wiscott. So Wis you know, Wiscott has multiple different parts to it. Um, so the immunologic piece to it, I think, would be probably corrected with fairly low-level donor myeloid chimerism. The platelet part, I'm a little bit more concerned about that you may need to push uh, that myeloid chimerism pretty high to get platelet counts uh, coming back in the you know 150 plus range. Um, so, so yeah, I think we 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 can get there eventually with monoclonals, but uh, that's still a few years away. Thank you. Um, a couple questions that seem to be related. So have you now treated at least one patient with each of the major known forms of SCID? I know you said that XSCID didn't do as well with this process. So which forms seem to do the best? Yeah, so it, it, yeah, it, it's kind of the opposite of what you normally think of. You normally think of XSCID um, and JAK3 and IL-7s being the easiest to transplant and RAG and Artemis being the most difficult. 
but it's but in fact we're seeing the best results with again retransplant boosts uh, with the antibody in the rags and the artemis and less good in the um, il2 rgs we've not done a jack three yet or an il7 um, so i can't comment on those uh, but in the, in the babies it's then it's more like the traditional thinking where the IL-2 RG baby did really well and the, the rag skid baby unfortunately um, rejected uh, her first transplant because there's again there's nothing else in there to prevent rejection so we quickly moved on to a a, a unfortunately a condition transplant uh, for her she's now doing well uh, so it didn't really work for her because we need to we need to build in essentially a, a immunoablation piece for those patients that need immunoablation. Thank you. Um, so we have another question. Somebody is asking, what is the best conditioning available for an unrelated ten out of ten matched donor with ADA skid? Oh, um, that's a tough question. Uh, you know, it depends a little bit on how old the patient is and, um, you know, how well they're doing on enzyme replacement. Honestly, our, most of our ADA skids that have been born in the last uh, few years that don't have matched siblings, we have not been doing unrelated donor transplants on them. And we've basically been maintaining them on enzyme with uh, plans to uh, do gene therapy once that's available. The gene therapy data for ADA SCID um, has been really spectacular. Uh, you may have seen Don Cohn just published a, a great paper in New England Journal yesterday um, of the worldwide experience, uh, or sorry, the, the US and UK experience uh, for it. Um, so honestly, I wouldn't do a mud transplant for ADA skid right now, unless there was some, you know, desperate reason. And then I need to hear a lot more details. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, we have another question that says, what is the reason that there is such a variation in results in the different forms of skid? Yeah, it's a great question. We're, we're spending a lot of time thinking about this and what we've what we've come to in conjunction with, uh, with some uh, experts around the country is that some of the, the IL-2-RG skid patients that did not benefit from repeat transplant, in retrospect, all of them had um, very skewed immune systems. So most of them, um, all, you know, these were patients that were typically 10 plus years out from their original transplant had um, modest doses of modest numbers of night of CD4 cells, typically, you know, 100 to 200. Uh, most of those not naive T cells, just memory, and then had this big population of CD8 uh, cells, uh, like typically a thousand plus. So very skewed, not a nice balance between CD4s and CD8s. And we think those CD8s, um, based on some, some very early unpublished data, are producing um, some cytokines in an unregulated fashion that are interfering with engraftment. So we're now, we've gone back to the drawing board and, and uh, several thought leaders have, have put together different approaches to how we might sort of dampen down those uh, donor CD8s that are actually interfering with um, in you know, engraftment of donor stem cells in sort of an autoimmune fashion. Uh, we've not tested that in a person yet, but we're pretty close to, to doing that. Um, and if that works, that will, um, you know, I think you know, hopefully eliminate the problem we're seeing with the X-Link skids. Thank you. And then the only other question I see coming in is someone is wondering how old were the oldest group A patients in your anti-C kit trial? Yeah, the, the oldest one we did here was 34. Um, definitely felt a little funny to have her on the, um, the pediatric unit for a couple of days, uh, but um, we, she's lovely, so we don't mind having her uh, with us. And I, I think one of the Sloan patients may have even been older than that, but I, I actually don't know off the top of my head, but definitely we can go fairly old. <laughs> 
All right, I do see another question has come in. Is it possible that the CD4 engraftment you saw with the antibody could have occurred without conditioning in the newly diagnosed patient? It could have for sure. In fact, it probably did, um, would have, because uh, an IL-2-RG would engraft without antibody. Um, so what, what really is going to be, but it, it did come back faster, I think, than I would have typically expected. And the early data is suggesting that, um, that the patient has donor B cells, and that's what you would not get um, in an unconditioned X-link skid. Uh, so I think the patient is not off IVIG yet, but is looking very promising. Um, and that, that's the, the, um, the cool advance. All right. Thank you, Dr. Dvorak. That is all the questions that I see coming in. So I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your wealth and knowledge with the IDF and SCID communities. This is such great information about the future of treatment for children with SCID as well as under other conditions. So, so thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here with us. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you to all of our participants for also being here. If you have additional questions about SCID um, or anything else related to primary immunodeficiencies, you can always ask IDF. You can call us or go online and submit your questions to askidf at primaryimmune.org slash ask-idf. And someone from our team will uh, be able to respond to you with, your, with an answer. And before we sign off, I just want to please uh, point out that you should take advantage of all of the resources IDF has to offer. This includes a newly updated IDF patient and family handbook for primary immunodeficiency diseases, which also includes an updated chapter on SCID. Um, the handbook is easy to be downloaded um, and is available online. We also have a number of other publications and resources available on the SCID Compass website, which are easily um, found and downloaded directly. I also just want to make sure everyone is aware that the upcoming Primary Immunodeficiency Conference is coming up this June 23rd through 26th. Registration is now open and can be found on the IDF website at primaryimmune.org slash conference. Um, the conference is free for all in attendance this year, um, and we, it will be four days of tons of information about navigating life with all types of PI. So we hope to see you there. And then just finally, thank you again for tuning in to the Skid Compass Lunch and Learn. Please join us next month when Kim Ong, a child life specialist from Benioff Children's Hospital at UCSF, will present on supporting infants' needs while hospitalized during our June Lunch and Learn. It'll be June 4th at 12 p.m. Eastern, and registration is open and can be uh, accessed at skidcompass.org slash events. And if you would like to make sure you are on our email list uh, for other Skid Compass events, please make sure you create or update an account by going to skidcompass.org and clicking on my account in the upper right-hand corner. So thank you all for being here today. And thank you again uh, to Dr. Dvorak for sharing his time and his talent and have a great rest of your day. And we hope to see you again uh, next month. Take care, everyone.